We're going to return to our discussion of game theory. Uh, last time, we distinguished various kinds of games. We talked about sequential games as opposed to simultaneous games. A sequential game being one where one player plays and then the other player responds and so on. Uh, a simultaneous game where both players have to play at once, really, without knowing what the other person's doing. And we talked about zero sum or constant sum games where there's a fixed amount and then it's a question of how that ends up getting divided up as a result of the game play. And other cases where there isn't a fixed amount, where everybody can get more, everybody can get less. Sometimes you can take the same game as we saw and view it both ways. So let's say we're talking about a game in which somebody wins, somebody loses. If you're just thinking about the win-loss column, it looks like there's a fixed sum, right? There's one victory, and it's a question of which team gets it. If you're thinking about the score, on the other hand, it might not be like that. There can be a high-scoring game or a low-scoring game. So let's say we're thinking about hockey. Or what, what's a sport where, tie, I mean, baseball maybe. Ties are impossible, uh, let's say. Well, in that kind of case, there is one team that's going to win, one team that's going to lose. From that point of view, it's a zero-sum contest. On the other hand, it might be a high-scoring game. I remember well going to a ball game the night I, I got my PhD. I passed my oral exam on, the, on my dissertation and then went to a baseball game. And it was great. Went out of the stadium. They were, there were firemen there passing out free tickets. So I figure I won't ask any questions. I'll take a free ticket. Well, it was very far up in the stadium. But it was also then a wild game. It was the Pittsburgh Pirates versus the St. Louis Cardinals. And I think the final score was something like 14 to 8. It was just crazy. That's very high for a baseball score. On the other hand, I've been to games that were 1 to nothing. So anyway, you know, if you're thinking of run scored, it can be it's not at all a fixed sum. It can increase, it can decrease. Yeah. Question of the kinds of games. It matters a lot what kind of game we're playing. We have to know, for example, whether it's a simultaneous game or a sequential game. If it's simultaneous, I have to guess what your strategy might be. I don't know what you're going to be playing. Whereas, on the other hand, if it's sequential, it's really important that I know what move you just made. And I'm going to have my structure depend on that, so I need to know. And the same thing with a zero-sum game. If, if somebody else moves ahead, is that going to come potentially at my expense? Or can we both win out of that? Is there an opportunity for mutual cooperation? So to form a strategy for playing this game, I need to know what game I'm playing. Now, in a way, that's really obvious. It's like, mm, how are we going to play? Is it baseball, football, hockey, chess? Matters, right? <laughs> but it also matters in an organizational context. I think, oh, OK, I'm a new employee. I notice that a lot of the people who've been hired recently got fired after a short time. I don't want to be fired after a short time. So I want to think, OK, how do I avoid this? How do I play this game? What kind of game am I playing? And it won't be that obvious. And I have to know not only what kind of game this is, but also, yeah, in detail, how much information am I going to have about what other people are, go are doing? But also, crucially, how much do my interests here overlap with the other players? Are we in competition? Let's say it might be a situation where we're all junior in this law firm, and only one of us is going to make partner. Well then, gosh, that's like a zero-sum game or a fixed-sum game where, yes, there is one partnership available, and we're all competing for that one slot. Or is it the case? that maybe it's not like that, and we can actually cooperate and help one another. So it go it's going to matter. I have to know how much my interests overlap with the other people. And so I need to think, yeah, to what extent can I cooperate with other people? Should I cooperate with them? To what extent should I compromise with them? It's like, yeah, we're opposed, and we can't really cooperate to get our mutual goal, because we don't have any mutual goals. But maybe we can compromise. Maybe we're just in competition, OK? If you are, let's say, you're playing in the Super Bowl, um, you don't really cooperate with the other team. You, know, you don't say, hey, we'll let you get a certain number of first downs if you let us get a certain number. You don't compromise and say, well, we're not going to really try very hard until the third quarter as long as you don't try. You're in competition. You have to know that. Also, sometimes you're just in outright conflict with the other person. and any gain of yours is going to come at their expense and vice versa. So you've got to identify the situation. Now, one way to think about this is to think about the other individual players. What are their preferences like? 
Suppose <laughs> we're in a relatively simple game where there are only four possible outcomes. And I rank those outcomes in terms of my preferences, one, two, three, and four. Okay, my first choice, my second choice, my third choice, my fourth choice. Now these are just ordinal numbers. As we've mentioned in games, we can think about cardinal utilities, and often that's appropriate, but sometimes we can think about the form just thinking, well, what are my preferences? Think of it in ordinal number terms. Well, then here are the 24 possibilities for another player. Maybe we agree exactly. They share my preference ordering precisely. I say, this one's first, this one's next best, this one's last, and this is the worst. They say, yeah, totally with you on all that. It might be like that. It could be the complete opposite. They say, no. <laughs> I think the fourth is the best. Third, second, then what you call the first, I think that's the worst option. But then it can be any of those things in between, right? And so in a certain sense, before you even get into the details of thinking about this, you've got to think, what is my relation to this other player? How do my preferences line up with theirs? So let's think about an example. You've got interests that uh, put you in relation to, for example, my interests in teaching this course. To what extent do those interests overlap? Are they the same? Now, in a certain sense, they're the same, right? I mean, if we look at it from one point of view, we could say, well, I want you all to succeed. So we both agree that the best option is you get an A. <laughs> okay, second best option, you get a B, et cetera. But now you might think, but still, we can all achieve that if we just say, give everyone A's. We all get what we want, let's go home. <laughs> so it's more complicated than that. Now that brings up a couple of things. One is we both care about other things than just the outcome in terms of a grade. I care how much you learn. Maybe you care how much you learn, I hope you do. Um, you might care about other things like how much work is involved and so on. So that's complicated, first of all. But secondly, we can think, well then, yeah, to what extent do our um, preferences about all of this really agree. Suppose we think workload and the amount of work you do for this course. What would your first choice be? A little. A little. Yeah. Wow, you're no wonder. You're <laughs> that explains a lot. But no. <laughs> but no, okay, suppose you say, look, I'm a busy person. The less work for me, the better. Is that my preference? Well, no. Now, is my top choice that you just work like dogs on my course alone? Well, not really, actually. I'd like you to work hard at it. But on the other hand, I'm not really thinking the best choice is a bunch of people who do nothing but study what I'm trying to teach. And so we're going to partially overlap here, but not entirely overlap. And that seems to be really vital to recognize. To take a very simple example. If I have that preference ordering, one, two, three, four, and then Alice has the same ordering, look, we can cooperate perfectly, right? We have the same goals, we have the same preferences, we have the same likes and dislikes. So Alice and I are naturally on the same team, no problem. Bob, ah, we're in perfect conflict. He ranks them in exactly the opposite order. Now maybe we can compromise. We can say, well, let's settle on two, or let's settle on three, but, any gain for me in terms of getting something I'd like better comes at his expense, right? So we're directly in co conflict. But what about Carol? She ranks these options one, four, two, three. Now notice we agree about some things. We agree that one is the best option. And so that's an important thing to recognize if I'm thinking, okay, here's another player in this game. We don't agree about everything, but we do agree about that. Also, we agree that one is better than two and two is better than three. The only difference here is she thinks four is a lot better than I think it is. So that tells us, okay, we've got a lot of ground for agreement. As long as four isn't the issue, we're in good shape. We can cooperate a lot. If on the other hand, four is the question, ah, then we may be in conflict. And then Dave, say his are three, four, two, and one. Well, we agree about a little bit Right? We agree that three is better than four, but otherwise we disagree on pretty much everything. And so if I'm thinking, who can I work together with and who am I in conflict with? <laughs> the answer is gonna be, Alice, no problem. We can work together and we can cooperate to achieve 
the same goals. Bob, mm, at best I can compromise with Bob. We're in a situation of conflict. Carol, we can mostly agree. There's just this one issue we're going to have problems about. Dave, we mostly disagree. There's one thing we really do agree about. And so the point is, think about this sort of thing in an organization. And think about what you're trying to get, what you prefer. Think about what other people want. Now, in our private lives, when does this even come up? I mean, it's natural to think about this in terms of politics. Here I am in the legislature. I have my certain views. I'm thinking, who can I work together with on legislation? Who am I arguing against? Who can I form a coalition with on this issue or that issue? This is vital. The same thing can be the case in an organization. You're trying to accomplish something. Who are your allies in that organization? Who are your enemies? And for the whole organization, who are your allies? Who are your enemies? And so on. But like, where does anything like this come up in your own ordinary day-to-day -day life? Yeah. I mean, honestly, just making like friends. Like, if you really don't have any of the same interests and you really just disagree on those things, you're really not going to be friends. Okay, good. Yeah, we've talked about friendship, right? And these quality matching relationships. Well, what are my chances of being good friends with Bob? They don't seem very good, right? We don't agree about anything. Hey, Bob says, Maybe we should get to know each other. Want to have lunch? Yeah. And he says, well, what kind of food do you like? Eh, Chinese. Hate Chinese. What are now, this is a bad example for me, because I pretty much like food. So <laughs> it's hard for me to think of something I wouldn't like. Um, but basically, yeah, Bob and I aren't going to see eye to eye about anything. Alice, on the other hand, if anything, the danger might be we just sit around nodding at each other, right? You know, I say, wow, this is great. She said, yeah, that's great. You know, and, and so on, and everything is like, but still, that's pretty good for a friendship often. It's like, yeah, we agree about things. Carol, yeah, as long as four doesn't come up. You know? <laughs> and so on. So you're right, in forming friendships, this is pretty, because a friendship, what is it? it? From this point of view, at least, it's more than this, but it's at least a kind of alliance, a kind of coalition you're forming with somebody else. Hey, you and I agree about enough things and like enough of the same things, we can enjoy being together. And, and if you disagree about too many things, it's going to be hard. Other places. I was going to mention going out to eat with family. Going out to eat with family. OK, yeah. good, good, yes. Right, because even if you think, OK, it's, it's not like I don't like that, just think you do have preferences. And so, yes, um, some families have different ways of dealing with this than others. Uh, in mine, we tend to say, what do you want to do? Well. I actually, I've talked about these problems before. <laughs> I had to cut out a little segment where I mentioned my wife's strategy in these. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it can be a problem, right? If everybody agrees, then it's great. You know exactly what you want to do. If they disagree, uh, maybe you have to reach some compromises. Um, when my kids were little, they disagreed all the time. And so there was always this need for a compromise. In some families, somebody just says, I lay down the law. We're just doing this. Um, so. <laughs> You've got to have some way of resorting to, well, if you don't agree, resolving the conflicts, reaching compromises, taking turns, whatever it is. Other examples? Yeah. And the allocation of resources, if you're on a committee or like an organization. Good, allocation of resources, exactly. You're on some committee or you're part of an organization, and let's say it's a question of budget or it's a question of manpower and what you're going to devote your attention to. Um, Let's say you go in thinking the most important thing for our committee to talk about is this, and then it's that, and so on. And somebody else may have a very different idea. So I've been on this committee recently. Um, we were asked, so what's it, what are your top priorities? What do you think we ought to be doing? I said, well, I think the most important thing is this. And immediately someone else, the most famous person on the committee, said, no, I think that's totally wrong. It should be this. <laughs> and so several others started. Yeah, you know, saying something similar. And others said, but wait, if we, you can't do that until you've done this. And, and in short, it was an attempt to say, there, not so much money at stake, just where do we devote our attention? What issue do we focus on? And that's the kind of thing that arises in all sorts of contexts, in organizations, in clubs, but just within a family, right? Somebody says, hey, you know, we're going on vacation. What do you want to do? And it's a similar kind of issue. People have very different ideas about the ideal vacation. 
Um, for some people, it's lying on the beach. For some people, it's climbing thousands of vertical feet in the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> for some people, it's some other thing. So anyway, um, yeah, it's, it's a very different conception, and you have to sort all that out. OK, well, let's think about some other questions here. We've talked about the difference between these kinds of games. And in order to understand the structure of a game in general, I'm going to use this kind of diagram. And now you can see why I've moved to slides instead of drawing the blackboard, because it's hard to keep the colors of things straight with chalk, even if I bring in my own colored chalk. But here, I can put things in colors, and I hope you can see that. Um, the idea is, this is a very simple game. There are two players in this game, A and B, which we'll designate over there. A is the sort of row player, <laughs> and A has two options. In this example, just, well, going right or going left, but it doesn't matter. Option one, option two. And then here, B is the other player. B's represented in terms of the columns, and again, has two options. So this is a simple two by two game. Um, some games are like this. Most interesting games are much more complex. But then we look inside and say, well, what's the outcome? Suppose A goes to the right and B goes to the right. Well, then we get something like here that indicates an outcome. The first one here I've designated as blue because that's the outcome for A. The second one of the pair is the outcome under that scenario for B. And we can think that through for each of the options. Ah, you play right, he plays left. Ah, you get this. And here I've represented these as ordinals, first, second, and so on. But they could be cardinal numbers too. Maybe here you get five points. Here you get zero points, and so on. OK, so we're going to see that kind of structure a lot. And that's the meaning of that sort of diagram. Now, let's think about a super simple game. This is called Two Finger Mora. And you might have played this as a kid or you know, you're trying to decide how to resolve a conflict between the two of you. And so you say, OK, odds or evens. And you say, you know, on three, one, two, three. And then you see whether the total of fingers you've put out are odd or even. Um, and so in this case, let's just assume instead of any number of fingers, it's really just one or two. I, I do remember playing this in elementary school, but we had a more complex version where you could do anything. And, so sometimes it would be none, and sometimes it was five. And we got to practice our arithmetic doing this. But it was an inefficient form of the game, because all that matters is odds or evens. Anyway, we might represent it this way, OK? Player A calls evens. So what happens? Well, you have a choice here of putting out one finger or two fingers in playing the game. And A wins if it's an even number total. So suppose A puts out one finger, and B puts out one finger. One plus one is two. It's an even number. And so A wins. B loses. Okay, And we'll represent that with a one here and a minus one there. But what if one puts out one, and the other player puts out two? Then A loses, and B wins. And the same thing if B puts out one finger and A two. Well, again, A loses, B wins. And then if they both put out two fingers, it's even again, so A wins, B loses. And so that's a super simple game, but you can see already that we can represent the outcome in this sort of structure. Notice it's a zero sum game. Take any of these cells and add it up, it's just zero. Win, loss, minus one, plus one. So um, that's a good example of a zero sum game. Well now, let's look at this from A's point of view. <laughs> A can't control what B is going to do, but A has preferences about the outcome. So A is trying to figure out a strategy. And A says, well, OK, if that player plays one, hmm, let's see. I would rather, actually, I've, why have I drawn the arrows in this direction? I don't know. Well, that was stupid. Did I keep making that mistake? Um, yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, this is a disadvantage of doing slides like this. It makes sense to you when you do it. And then you look at it later and think, 
crap, now I can't change it. <laughs> if it were on the blackboard, I could just say, oh yeah, I meant it to be this way. But anyway, I'll go with what's here for the moment. Um, basically, think of the arrow here as representing better than, okay? So from A's point of view, this is a lot better outcome than that, right? I'd rather win than lose. So this one's better than that one. On the other hand, if the other player plays two fingers, well, I like winning better than losing, so this option is better for me. So notice that if B plays one, then this is the better option for me. If B plays two, this is the better option for me. Now, in other words, what I should do depends on what the other player is doing. But of course, this is a simultaneous game. I don't know what the other player is going to do. It would be very different if I could say, OK, we're going to play two finger more. I call even. You go first. <laughs> Then it's like, no problem. You do this, I do that, and I win. But in this case, I don't know. So later we're going to learn a term for this. A has no dominant strategy. A dominant strategy would mean it's the best thing to do no matter what the other player is doing. At least it makes you no worse off no matter what the other player is doing. And here, there's nothing like that. It totally depends on what the other player does. Well, if we turn around and look at this from B's point of view, we see something similar. Um, because then B can say, well, wait a minute. I, you know, look, I'm now representing odds. So if you call one, I want to call two. And if you call two, I want to call one. And so it looks as if in this situation, I also have no dominant strategy. I want to adapt what I'm doing to what you're doing. But of course, I don't know that. So. That's why it becomes something that feels like an even game. If we put those arrows together, we see they don't settle anywhere. They just go around in a circle. Suppose I knew what you had done, and I said, OK, you keep what you're doing constant. I might well change. Somebody would have an incentive to change and could change it. So this game, if you look at that cycle, this game has no equilibrium. Well, this idea of an equilibrium in a game was developed by John Forbes Nash, Jr., who was one of the key founding figures of game theory. Um, there's a movie, A Beautiful Mind, about his life. And he accomplished a variety of things in mathematics and economics. This was only one of them. But it was a major contribution. And we still call a certain kind of equilibrium in game theory a Nash equilibrium. The idea is, at an equilibrium point, no player has anything to gain by changing strategy, given what the other players are doing. So every player is making the best decision they could make, given the decision of the other. Well, you can see that in this game, there is no pure strategy Nash equilibrium. That is to say, it's not like there's any play you can make to say, aha, that's always a winner for me. If you go into this game of two finger mora thinking, <laughs> kind of a Homer Simpson thought, I always play one. It's always the best thing to do. That's not true, right? <laughs> yeah, it depends on what the other person is doing. And so there is no strategy that is like this. There's no point, for that matter, where neither player could do better by changing what they did. Well, a pure strategy is something I just mentioned. It provides a complete definition of how to play the game. It tells you what to do deterministically in each of those scenarios. And so it determines the move you'll make in any situation. You could say the set of those available to you is your strategy set. And that would be one way of looking at this game. Say, well, all right, what's my pure strategy? Play one, <laughs> play two. Um, that's about it. And neither one is going to lead to victory no matter what. However, there are also things called mixed strategy equilibria, where I think, ah. Now, in fact, if you're playing this game, what should you do? Suppose you're playing it repeatedly against the same person. What's your best bet? Good, trying to catch a pattern in what the other person's doing, right? Because if you can figure that out, and by the way, there are, we'll get in a moment to rock, paper, scissors. They're actually rock, paper, scissor competitions. They're like big contests. Thousands of people enter and go for prize money. And you think, well, I don't get it. I mean, how do you win at rock, paper, scissors? The answer is you try to analyze the other person. I look at you and I think, are you a rock person? Are you a scissor person, right? <laughs> and I try to guess, because actually, 
the rational thing to do in a game like this or in rock, paper, scissors is to not let yourself be predictable. So it is just to be completely random in what you do and to do each of them roughly a third of the time, but on no identifiable pattern. But just as a, a random number generator is a very hard thing to actually construct, they, I mean, we approximate those, but they're not really random. The same thing is true in human behavior. It's actually really hard to be random. Kind of amazing when you think about it, because a lot of people seem kind of irrational. <laughs> but it's actually very hard to be random if you're trying to be random. And so you try to guess the other player. But what are you trying to do, in addition to guess what they're going to do? Well, you try to be random yourself, so that the other person can't guess what you're going to do. And consequently, yeah, the best mixed strategy here will be just be play them with 50-50 probability. In any case, in this case, if you follow the arrows, it becomes clear this game has no pure strategy Nash equilibrium. It will have an equilibrium where both players just play 50%, this 50%, that, and in general then are just mixing it up in a completely random fashion. Well, Nash does have this existence theorem. This is one of his fundamental results, which says every game with a finite number of players, in which each player can choose from finitely many pure strategies, so it's important it be a finite game, have at least one Nash equilibrium. Okay? Every game that's finite in both senses has a Nash equilibrium. But as we've just seen, it's not always a pure strategy Nash equilibrium. Sometimes it means you're mixing things up probabilistically. You're doing things at random. So sometimes it's rational to be irrational, <laughs> or at least to behave randomly. More formally, we could say a mixed strategy is just a probability assignment over the pure strategies. Play this 50% of the time, this 50% of the time. And that would allow you to select one of these at random. Um, and so we've always got one of these, but it might be mixed, as it is in this case. And lots of times, there are these mixed strategies, especially in com competition. You don't, know what the you don't want the opposition to know what you're doing. So go back to that football example we were talking about last time. You're the offensive coordinator. It's first and 10. Just got the ball on your own 20-yard line. What do you do? Throw it. He wants to throw it. I'd say a screen. Screen pass. Yes, that's, that's the standard Texas move. Half Circa uh, 2010. Sorry? Half back dive. Half back dive. OK. D do you want to have any of these as your pure strategy? Do you want to say first and 10? Yeah, we always do this. <laughs> Can't lose doing that. No, you want to mix it up, right? You don't want the defense to know what you're going to do. And so all of those are plausible things that you might do on first down. You want some probabilistic mix over that, and you want it to be random. Now, notice in a football game, in certain places, it does tend to be random, or at least you can approximate that. At certain other points, it's very hard to be random in this way. You know, you're in the last 45 seconds of the first half. You've got the ball. You're trying to go 80 yards to the touchdown. Do you do the halfback dive? <laughs> Almost certainly not, right? Probability of that is way low. Now, maybe it doesn't go to zero, because you want that option in case you want to surprise the other team. They go into a prevent defense, and you think, ah, nobody's up here near the line. Maybe we can do that. But in general, you're going to say, yeah, certain things are going to become much more probable, the long pass, the pass toward the sideline, et cetera. Other things are going to be much less probable. So in short, your strategy in that kind of game will be a mixed strategy all the time, really. But the mix is going to change depending on the game situation. Now, sometimes they are very useful, as in football or two-finger Mora. <laughs> and basically, that's when you don't want the other player to know what you're going to do. Now, outside of sports, what are examples like that, where you don't want the other player to know what you're going to do? It's to your advantage that they not know what you're up to. Yeah. Negotiations. Good, negotiations, right? So, so you get a job offer. You graduate with a degree in philosophy or human dimensions of organizations from UT Austin. You're a hot commodity in the job market, right? All these people are clamoring to hire you. And you get this offer. And now they say, I mean, they might just tell you, here's the salary we're offering. And I highly recommend that you take it if they did that. <laughs> However, suppose. It's more nuanced than that. There's a negotiation. They say, well, tell me, what kind of salary would you accept? Or 
what kind of salary are you making now? Now, if you're a new graduate, that may not be applying, but if this is like your second job, they might ask that question. And then you think, oh, that's like a sequential game where they're asking me to move first. Now, sometimes it's a huge advantage to move first. Sometimes it's a huge disadvantage. And in this context, we'll talk a lot more about those later. But here, you might think, that's a real disadvantage. I mean, what if they're thinking, yeah, we're going to offer this person $60,000 a year. And I say, well, yeah, I, I, I was hoping for 40 or more. <laughs> right? <laughs> So that's a situation where it's tough. On the other hand, they think maybe 60. And you say, well, I was hoping you know, for that beach house in Venice, California to get away to. So I won't accept anything out less than a seven-figure salary. They're like, goodbye. <laughs> Actually, um, I do know of a case in academia where someone was offered a job and came back saying, well, first of all, that's not high enough salary. Secondly, I want more blah, blah, blah. I want this. I want a guaranteed time off, blah, blah. And they wrote back and just said, um, we're withdrawing our offer. <laughs> so uh, you've got to be very careful about these negotiation moves. And you've got to guess what the other player is willing to offer, what they will view as unreasonable, what might be lower than they're actually expecting, et cetera. So it's tricky. You don't want the other player typically to know what you'll really do. You don't know, want them to know the minimum salary you'd accept. Um, and they don't want you to know how much money they've actually allocated in the budget for this job. <laughs> uh, you engage in this dance where you try to figure those things out. Are there other cases where you don't want the other player to entirely know what you're up to? Yeah. Couldn't we just say whenever you're really dealing with an opponent, you don't Good. want them, maybe, maybe you want them to think or to know what you're going to do for one move so that you can anticipate that and get them on the next one. but. but Overall, Good. To know in the end what you're doing. Good, exactly. So anytime you're in competition, anytime you're in a situation of conflict, you tend not to want the other party to know what you're doing. It might be true in wartime. You don't want the enemy to know where you're going to attack. And in fact, Eisenhower, for example, before D-Day, went to a lot of trouble to make the Germans think that he was going to attack in a different place. Um, and that's a common thing in wartime. Um, as we'll learn when we get to Sun Tzu, War is based on deception, <laughs> and it's all about that. But you might say it's not, it doesn't have to be a fancy wartime thing. Anytime there's a situation of conflict, um, you don't want the other party to know what strategy you're playing. Say you're just kids playing hide and seek. If, I mean, if you always hide in the bedroom closet, you know the other player knows where to find you. You don't want to play the same play all the time. Yeah. You had an example a moment ago. War, oh, sorry, I stole your thunder. But yeah, war is excellent. Any other situation of conflict, of competition, of a situation where you want to keep the other party viewed as your opponent guessing. Now notice, it's not so great if you want people to cooperate. Like, you know, you've got a friend you're going to meet for lunch. You say, hey, let's get together for lunch. Yeah, sounds good, I'll be done with class. Sure, <laughs> guess where I'll be. <laughs> I'll go to some place near campus. You try to figure out where I am. That's, a, I mean, that's weird, right? That's not going to work out very well for your friendship. So this is something that's typically going to be good in a situation of conflict um, or competition, not very good in a situation of, comp comp well, of uh, cooperation. Okay? And indeed, sometimes if we're trying to cooperate, then doing this would be terrible. We're going to see an example later um, about driving. Should we drive on the left or drive on the right? It's very important we agree, agree and cooperate. If it's kind of like, I don't know, I'll do it 50-50 probability. You guess where I'm going to be. That's very, very bad. <clears throat> I know, sometimes it does feel like that. Um, it's interesting that the more people in driving, I mean, I'm interested in situations in driving that aren't really specified by the rules. Like, suppose you're in a setting where two different lanes have to merge into one lane. How do you do that? Um, it's, it's not obvious what strategy you ought to follow. And what I've noticed is that in different places, there are very different patterns that emerge from drivers, depending on how frequently you encounter this. Normally, driving in New York City is not a fun thing. I don't really recommend it. But this is one place where New Yorkers are super good. They have to do this. Everybody just immediately takes turns. Everybody knows that's the rule. That's the most efficient way to do it. In Pittsburgh, if you have to do that, 
It's kind of like, you yell at the other person, you shout at them. Pittsburgh's a very friendly place, but that means in a situation of conflict or competition, it's also a really unfriendly place. Uh, and so you basically maximize potential for conflict. In Texas, when I first moved here, it was kind of like, oh, you go. No, you go first. <laughs> it was kind of like a, hey, we're both so nice. Um, it's less so now. Californians are moving in. They're ruining it. Uh, but in any case, it's, it's a situation where, yeah, you've got to evolve some way of doing this, making it predictable for the other party. Let's talk about another game. It's a little more complicated than this. Rock, paper, scissors. Okay. Now, <laughs> you could be like, actually, I think it's Bart Simpson who challenged to play this game says, I'll go with rock. Nothing beats rock. <laughs> but of course, that's not how it works. If we want to represent this, we could represent it in this kind of way. We could say, well, all right, A has now three choices, right? Rock, paper, scissors, so does B. And here's how it comes out. It's just a, a tie, it's a draw if people play the same thing. But then it goes, well, paper covers rock. Rock smashes scissors, scissors cut paper. And so we can represent who wins and who loses in a simple diagram like this again, where one means you win, minus one means you lose. So I won't go through all the nine squares, but trust me, that's sort of how it looks. And then if we say, well, what are A's preferences here? You can say, well, gosh, okay, paper. Here, let's say B plays rock. I'm not in control of that decision, if I may. I can control this. Okay, they play rock. Well, I'd rather win than have a draw, and I'd rather win than lose. So it looks like then paper is my play. But if they play paper, I should play scissors. And if they play scissors, I should play rock. So again, I don't have a dominant strategy. Totally depends on what they're going to do, right? And similarly, they think it through, and they think it through the same way. So once again, there's no Nash equilibrium. There's no place where those settle. And we say, aha, all the arrows point us here. Everybody prefers this to certain other squares. No matter what square we're in, somebody has some incentive to move to some other strategy. Well, we can complicate this further, as on the Big Bang Theory. Rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, where the rules go like this. It's very simple. <laughs> scissors cuts paper. Paper covers rock. Rock crushes a lizard. Lizard poisons Spock. Spock smashes scissors. Scissors decapitates a lizard. Lizard eats paper. Paper disproves Spock. Spock vaporizes rock. And as it always has, rock crushes scissors. OK. And so we can put that game into the same matrix. It doesn't really matter how many options. <laughs> there, it's easiest to just see it like this. Um, and if you look at the arrows here about what beats what, you can see there's a connection between the fact that there's no place where all the arrows point, <laughs> right? They keep leading you around in circles. And the same thing is going to be true when we set it up as a game table. There won't be any Nash equilibrium. That is to say, any pure strategy Nash equilibrium. You'll have to mix strategies. You'll have to keep the other person guessing. Now, once you've got that complication, you can say, well, now I can make it arbitrarily complicated. Here's rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, Spider-Man, Batman, wizard, Glock. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Where we get a much more complicated thing. But again, notice no position here has all the arrows going into it or all the arrows going out. Uh, and so yes, um, I don't know if I want to go through all this. <laughs> but you can see Spock zaps wizard, wizard stuns Batman, Batman scares Spider-Man, Spider-Man disarms Glock. Glock breaks rock, rock interrupts wizard, wizard burns paper, paper disproves Spock, Spock befuddles Spider-Man, Spider-Man defeats lizard, lizard confuses Batman because he looks like Killer Croc, Batman dismantles scissors, scissors cut wizard, etc., etc. So anyway, you can, once you get the hang of this, you realize, oh yeah, I can just keep adding nodes as I like. Um, in any case, <laughs> We've been talking about games that are competitive, where mixed strategies end up being the best play. However, there are lots of games that aren't like that. In a coordination game, you're rewarded for cooperating with the other players. Okay? And you suffer when you don't cooperate. That is to say, certain matches of strategies are going to lead to a mutual benefit. Other strategy combinations are going to lead to mutual harm. And so you're rewarded when your strategies match the strategy appropriately of the other player. Now, that doesn't mean exactly the same. The nature of the match is going to depend on the particular game. Nevertheless, the idea is you gain by coordinating with the other players. So what are some examples of this kind of game? Yeah. Marriage. 
Marriage, yes, you gain by cooperating with the other player. You don't want, you know, <laughs> will I be home for dinner tonight? <laughs> I'll keep progressing. <laughs> Not a wise strategy. Or, you know, ah, date night. Yes, I'll be somewhere fun. <laughs> It's up to you to figure out where I am. Um, that's not a very likely successful strategy either. You want to cooperate. Other examples? Yeah? Advertising or oil pricing? OK, advertising, explain. All right, good, good, good. Yeah, if we think about market shares, then it looks like marketing is something like a zero-sum game. But actually, that's not the best way to look at it, right? Um, I don't want to market in a way that's going to reduce the market for um, sneakers, <laughs> even if that means they're going to be hurt worse than I am hurt by that. It's like, well, we'll lose money, but they'll lose a lot more. Ordinarily, that's not what I want. I would rather advertise in a way that isn't, that yes, makes people buy my product, but if it lends greater credibility to the whole genre and leads to sales increases for all of us, that's a good thing, right? So usually in a marketing campaign, I'm not interested in a sort of zero-sum approach so much as I am something that helps everybody in this category, and me especially. I want to be helped more, but on the other hand, I would rather have a larger share of a larger pie rather than a larger share of a smaller pie. And so I've got some incentive to cooperate. And the same thing can be true um, in oil pricing, as you mentioned. Our company is going to price ga its gasoline at a certain level. Well, we'd rather make it more than less. But on the other hand, if it's too much more, nobody will buy our gas. They'll go to our competitor. So there's an important sense in which we have to coordinate appropriately with the other people. All right, here's another simple example. Now, this is, I think, an apocryphal story. It did not really happen, but the story goes like this. In 1895, there were only two cars in Ohio. Guess what happened? They ran into each other because there were no rules of the road. This is not true. Um, but in any event, that's a common internet story. So think about that kind of game, the driving game, where we think, OK, we can drive on the right or drive on the left. Now, if I'm driving on the right and you're driving on the right also, that's good, right? We're, we're, we're promoting safety. If I'm driving on the right and you're driving on the left, we're going to be in trouble. And the same thing, we both get our first choice if we either both drive on the right or both drive on the left. So if we think about our preferences, A clearly prefers, <laughs> if he's driving on the right, that you do the same, but also prefers that if you're driving on the left, he drives the same. And so what A should do depends on what B is going to do. However, in this case, we do get Nash equilibria. In fact, we get two of them. B is going to have the preferences in favor of us doing the same thing as well. And so in the end, if we draw our arrows, it looks like this. In the end, these are the best scenarios, right? If we're both driving on the left, I don't have any incentive to change. That was my best strategy, given what you did. And similarly, if you're driving on the right, my best thing is to drive on the right. I have no incentive to change. So this is a situation where we get two pure strategy Nash equilibria. Now, there is a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, where we both just totally randomize. <laughs> but that's obviously a terrible outcome to this game. We want to be predictable. And so we can maximize our chances of this if we both drive on the right or both drive on the left. Here in the United States, we drive on the right. Ah. But we could be in Australia or Great Britain where we drive on the left. By the way, I've been in Scotland driving on the left. Shifting with your left hand is a very odd thing. But anyway, um, what happens when another car approaches you on a one-lane road? All your instincts as an American are, you go this way. Of course, all their instincts are, you go that way. Luckily, we did not collide. They just mocked me for being an American. <laughs> but anyway, that illustrates the importance of sticking with the Nash equilibrium. All right, next time we'll look at prisoner's dilemmas and more interesting games. <laughs>